All set. All right. Uh, good morning and uh, thanks for joining us. So this is uh, one of the distinguished uh, speaker uh, talks that we are hosting at the Hariri Institute for Computing and Computational Science and Engineering. Uh, the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, hosts innovative speakers like the one we have today, uh, talking about computing enabled and data driven research, fairly broadly defined. Uh, this speaker series is led by our junior faculty fellows, and I would like to acknowledge them for organizing the series. So, Anna Fisbein, who is in uh, biology, uh, Jonathan Huggins in uh, Math and Statistics, uh, Jonathan Jay, who is in Community Health Sciences, Sharik Mohammed, who is in the Department of Biostatistics, uh, Prasad Patil, who is in, also in Biostatistics, and uh, Jinglo Zhao, who is in uh, Operations and Technology Management at the Quenstrom School of Business. So I guess I don't need to motivate this further. Data science and statistics and machine learning are absolutely at the heart of modern computational research with uh, many different and wide applications from technology to medicine, to public health, to social science. Uh, in uh, today's uh, talk, uh, we will cover an area that is closer, I would say, to intersection of data science and uh, social sciences. Um, in terms of logistics, we encourage you to participate. If you are interested in asking a question, you will be able to do so through the Q&A feature of Zoom. We will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, and uh, the talk today will be recorded and we will post it later on the Hariri Institute's YouTube channel. Let me introduce the speaker. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have here today Kosuke Imai, who is a professor in the Department of Government and also has an appointment in the Department of Statistics at Harvard University. He specializes in the development of uh, statistical methods and machine learning algorithms and their applications to social sciences. Uh, his areas of expertise include causal inference, computational social science, program evaluation, and survey methodologies. And he has worked in, uh, in a number of very important application areas, including the randomized evaluation, of Mexican and Indian national health insurance programs and the algorithmic assessment of uh, legislative le redistricting in several states. Uh, so, Kosuke, the floor is, uh, is, is yours, the virtual floor that is. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Uh, so let me share the slides. Okay, um, I hope this works. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for having me for this uh, uh, speaker series. Um, I'm always excited about interdisciplinary work uh, in the area of data science and social sciences, and that's exactly what I do. So I'm uh, excited to give some uh, give a talk on uh, the recent project I've been working on. Yeah, so today I wanted to talk about the ex experimental evaluation of algorithm-assisted human decision-making uh, with application to pre-trial public safety assessment. So I wanted to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Ji Chao Jian, who is a statistician, uh, Jim Greiner, who is actually a law school professor uh, at Harvard, um, Ryan Heron is also a law school, and Soan Shin is a graduate student in the government department. So it's an uh, interdisciplinary team um, of my collaborators. Okay, so um, um, I'm having a hard time here. Okay, here you go. Um, all right, so just to motivate the uh, presentation, you know, as we know, there's statistics, machine learning, all these algorithms, AI are now in our daily lives. Um, this is really nothing new, but uh, has been accelerated 
due to the recent technological advances. So there's lots of examples uh, in our lives. Uh, we are surrounded by these algorithms all the time. Uh, today, what I wanna talk about is something what I call algorithm-assisted human decision-making. This is uh, motivated by my simple observation, but in, in, in that uh, in many instances, uh, we humans still make many consequential decisions. Okay, so for example, we haven't really outsourced these medical decisions uh, or judicial decisions entirely to the machines. Okay, so it's really it's still the human beings who are making uh, final decisions. Uh, in fact, even uh, things like online shopping, which are, aren't very consequential, we still make the final decision. Like for example, myself, I wouldn't tell Alexa to do the grocery shopping. Instead, I might get recommendations, but I still be the one who makes a purchasing decision. Uh, this is true even when human decisions can be suboptimal. Like we social scientists know a lot about the humans can be really bad about making certain type of decisions. Uh, even if when we know those things, uh, we still make the final decision. Uh, it might be because we want to hold somebody rather than uh, something accountable. Um, so as a result, what we observe in today's world, it's most prevalent system is something called algorithm assisted human decision making, where humans make decisions with the aid of um, algorithmic recommendations. Um, I, as I mentioned, the routine decisions made by individuals in daily lives uh, happen this way. And there are a lot of consequential decisions made by judges and doctors, which are made by humans, but with the help of algorithmic recommendations. Um, so my broader sort of uh, questions of interest in this uh, project is how do algorithmic recommendations influence human decisions? Um, in particular, do they help human decision makers achieve their goal? or do they help humans improve the fairness of their decisions? So the impact of algorithmic recommendations on human decision is something that I, I'm very much interested in. Um, in the literature, many people have studied the accuracy and fairness of algorithms themselves. I think a lot of work is done by computer scientists and others, um, but relatively few people have um, been working on their impacts on human decisions. And as you can imagine, once you have humans in the loop, things are very much more complicated uh, because you know it is difficult to understand the human decision uh, than the mathematical object of algorithms. And every human is different. So it's, there's a lot of heterogeneity that will make the analysis challenging. Um, as a result, I think the riddle is known about how the algorithmic bias interacts with the human bias. So what I want, hope to contribute um, is uh, the following. So first I want to present you the experimental evaluation of algorithm assisted human decision making. So how you might run the experiment to sort of figure out how the algorithm affects human, humans when they are making decisions. I'm gonna talk about some statistical methodology that sort of intersects with, you know, touches upon causal inference, fairness and the optimal decision. Um, and it, I think, um, Interestingly, uh, I'll present you the first ever field experiment, the actual experiment that's done in, in the real world, evaluating the pretrial public safety assessment. Okay. So let me jump into this um, experiment I'm gonna use to motivate the methodology and also the whole sort of project is driven by this specific application I've been uh, working on with my collaborator at the Harvard Law School. So uh, we're going to focus on the pretrial pre public safety assessment, which I call PSA. Uh, P it turns out the algorithmic recommendations have been used in the US criminal, criminal justice system for a relatively long time. Um, for this PSA, we're going to focus on the first appearance hearing. So if you uh, get arrested, uh, you'll be brought to the court and you appear in front of a judge. And the judge has to uh, make a primary to make two decisions. Uh, that they have to decide whether to release an arrest, um, arrestee pending disposition of criminal charges. So this is important point, it's a pre-trial um, period. So you haven't been formally charged yet or sentenced. 
And if you are to be released under what conditions? So for example, there might be a, a cash um, a bail uh, condition um, or there might be a, some monitoring condition uh, to be imposed. So the goal for the judge is to avoid the predispositional uh, incarceration while preserving public safety. So these people haven't been, um, you know, yet um, proven guilty. So we want to avoid the incarceration whenever possible, but at the same time, trying to protect the uh, public safety. Judges are required to consider three risk factors along with uh, others by law. Uh, first, uh, arrestee may fail to appear in the court, which I'm gonna call this FTA. Um, RST may engage in new criminal activity, uh, which I call, I'm going to call NCA. And RST may engage in new violent criminal activity, which I'm going to call NBCA. Okay. So they, they're, the judges are sort of supposed to consider these risk factors. Um, so PSA, a pretrial public safety assessment, is an algorithmic recommendation given to judges. It classifies RSTs according to these three types of risks. Um, it's derived from them some application of a, some proprietary machine learning algorithm. So we don't know exactly what the algorithm is um, to uh, some training data set based on the past observations. Um, it is different from compass score, which is sort of well known uh, in this uh, literature. Uh, but the idea itself is very similar. So using uh, data-driven um, algorithmic recommendations to, um, uh, you know, to help judges make a better decision. So we've conducted a field experiment uh, for evaluating this PSA. Um, and the data I'm going to show you today is uh, preliminary data from the Dane County, Wisconsin. So it's about half of the data that we have collected so far. Um, PSA in this county is a uh, weighted indices of 10 factors. Uh, most importantly, age is the only uh, demographic factor that's being used. So uh, in particular, gender and race are not being used. Uh, there are also nine factors drawn from crim criminal history. So it's something, things like prior convictions and prior FDA failure to appear. Uh, PSA scores consist of two separate ordinal six-point risk scores for FDA and NCA. There are three types of risks. So these two types of risks, there are six points risk score. And there is a one binary risk score for NBCA, new violent criminal activity. So there are three scores. And then these scores are aggregated to give uh, overall recommendation. Uh, in this study, I'm gonna focus on the like, three sort of categorical um, outcome. Uh, signature bond, which basically means that you can sign and then be released. Uh, small and large cash bond, uh, depending on whether the amount of cash bond is uh, greater or lower than $1,000. Uh, uh, judges may have other information about RST that we don't observe. So things like uh, there may be an affidavit sub submitted by a police officer about the arrest. Uh, or there may be defense attorney uh, is present at the hearing and it may inform something about the arrestee's connection to the community. Uh, for example, like family or employment situations. Um, many of our, the arrestees in the data don't have a uh, defense attorney, but, but some do. A field experiment uh, was conducted by in the following manner. So a clerk assigned the case number sequentially as can, cases enter the system. So a, as a person gets arrested, uh, the person gets assigned a case number. Uh, PSA is then calculated for each case uh, using the computer system. So importantly, these scores and recommendations were calculated for all cases. But half of the cases uh, received uh, PSA uh, algorithmic recommendations. So for these half the cases that when the first digit of a case number is even, uh, it's essentially random, but, but for the logistic reasons, we do it this way. Uh, PSA is given to the judge and the other half the cases, uh, PSA is not given to the judge. Now the, 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 the order in which the judge, uh, the RST may appear in front of a judge is not necessarily the same as case number. So um, it's not that judges um, 
you know, always seeing uh, the cases in the sequential order with and without PSA, it's 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 essentially mixed. So we can think of this as a, a, a PSA. The provision of PSA is being randomized. So what's important here is that PSA itself hasn't been manipulated, uh, which is be a difficult thing to do, um, you know, for the ethical reasons. But we are able to randomize the provision of the PSA to see how the provision affects the judging decisions. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, I'll be focusing on the uh, preliminary data about the first half of the data set uh, that we have obtained. We now have the second half, so uh, we'll be able to give uh, more update uh, once we analyze those, uh, that part of the data as well. Okay. So to give you a concrete sort of picture, uh, here is the report that judge actually receives. Um, so as you can see, there is a new violent criminal activity flag, which is the binary risk factor, yes or no. And then there are two six point ordinal uh, scores for new criminal activity and the failure to appear. And the higher the, um, the number is, the higher the risk, uh, according to the algorithmic recommendation. The judge also see the charges uh, and judge actually see all the inputs that, that are used um, for algorithmic recommendation construction. So what the provision of the algorithm PSA does is, is not so much about the new information uh, per se, but it's, 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 it's basically the algorithm is telling judges um, how these different factors should be weighted. And I'm not gonna give a, uh, detailed information, but but the way that these are aggregated is very simple. It's an integer weighted aggregation, and that information itself is publicly available. So there's really nothing uh, hidden in here for the sake of transparencies and the simplicity. So judge have all the information that the algorithm uses uh, to construct these recommendations, but um, you know algorithm is given to nudge. Uh, judge to consider certain factors more important than the others. And at the end of the um, um, report, you see the overall recommendation. So in this case, you see signature bond, which means that the RST can just assign the form and go. Uh, and then there's some uh, condition, monitoring condition. In this case, you have to report and comply with pretrial supervision. Okay, so this is so half of the cases, the judge will receive this kind of recommendation report, and then the other half of the case, uh, they won't be able to, uh, they won't see this, even though we can compute, we've computed these um, scores for the other half as well. All right, so here is sort of quick look at the data. Uh, as I said, there's two conditions, one with PSA, one without PSA. Um, in terms of demographic, you observe that uh, majority is male. Um, so that there are few, fewer number of female, especially non-white female is, uh, is only 8%. Um, you also notice that among the male, the white and non-white is about the same number. Um, this, uh, given that this is, you know, the uh, Wisconsin Dane County, where the University of Wisconsin Madison is, uh, this is actually overrepresenting um, the non-white male uh, in terms of the population. Okay. And you can also see the actual outcome, eventual outcome. So failure to appear is about 30%. So 30% people actually didn't appear uh, after being released uh, to the court. And you can see about the same proportion of people committed uh, uh, new uh, criminal activity. And it's a very small number of people committed, 109 of them committed the violent crim new criminal activity uh, during the release. Okay. You can also see um, most cases are receiving the signature bond uh, decision and um, smaller number of them are receiving the cash bond uh, decision. So in this case, the cash bond decision is the harshest decision that judge would uh, issue because most of the crimes that we analyze are pretty petty, petty crimes. So it's, they're not like a serious crime such as uh, murder. And so most of the um, cases, more than 60% of them, uh, or 70% of them actually, a judge is giving a signature bond decision. 
Okay. So um, here's another look at uh, how the judge decision correlates with um, PSA scores. Um, so in this um, figure, um, you see on the left, uh, failure to appear. So that's like six point ordinal scale. The width of the each bar represents a proportion of observations in the data. So as you can see that um, six, the risk score of six is the very smallest proportion of people receive that. And then the each color represents the judge decision. So signature bond is the lightest color. And then the large cash bond is the darkest color. So as you can see, there is sort of an upward trend here, which means that among the cases which received higher risk scores, like six and five and four, for example, uh, judge tend to give um, harsher decision. We, in this case, the large cash bond is the harshest decision. Okay, so, so there's some correlation, positive correlation between the judge decision and the PSA itself. You see that uh, same pattern, new criminal activity NCA scores as well, as uh, and also NDCA. So the the you know cases that uh, got the yes flag for NC uh, NBCA tend to receive the large cash bond decision. And the last column shows the, um, the overall recommendation, aggregate recommendation, how that's correlated with the judge decision. Again, the judge seems to be, you know, decision is positively correlated. Now, this, uh, these figures are produced using the treatment group. So these are the cases where judges actually receive, um, receive the algorithmic recommendation we can also look at the same figure uh, for the control group where the judges actually didn't receive the algorithmic recommendation because this recommendation can be calculated um, for every single case. Okay, uh, so in the control group, you can see there's still some correlation, although even it, um, maybe the correlation is slightly less, but, but you do see there is sort of an upward um, um, trend in the figure suggesting that um, the judge's uh, decision seems to be correlated, positively correlated with the algorithmic recommendation, even in the absence of actually seeing the uh, recommendation itself. So that's sort of the, what the data look like. And now I'm gonna go into the analysis. The first thing you can do is um, fairly simple. So you can just do uh, what, what, you know, uh, what we might call in this causal inference, intention to treat analysis. So this is just a simple comparison of treatment group and control group, just trying to see how the provision of algorithmic recommendation affects the judge decision. Okay, so I'm gonna simply take a mean of each group and of the outcome and then compare the difference between the two. Okay. So in this figure, uh, you look at like overall versus some sub subgroups, female, male, and non-white male versus white male. I have three decisions. So signature bonds, small cash bond, large cash bonds. So I'm gonna basically look at the probability of judges issuing each of these decisions. That's mutually exclusive. So they're gonna make one of the uh, three options. I'm gonna, they're gonna choose from one of the three options and then see how the provision of PSA affected that probability, okay? And as you can see in the overall, uh, on average, the provision of the the, the PSA, the algorithmic recommendation, doesn't seem to affect um, judge decision at all on average. So there's some you know, uncertainty confidence with the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval, but overall the point estimate is close to zero. So that means that uh, on average, the PSA provision isn't really affecting the judge decisions. You see um, across the subgroups, there are some uh, differences, but the statistical uncertainty is uh, large enough that you cannot conclude. Um, on average, the PSA has um, provision influenced the judge decision. Okay, so there's an statistically insignificant effect effects on judge decisions. You can also look at the downstream outcome. So this is the effect of PSA provision on the arrestee's uh, behavior. And here again, you see that on average, uh, the effects are not really significant. Um, so I look at the effect on FDA, effect on NCA, and effect on um, NVCA. 
and then you can see that um, that you know overall on average um, the effect is insignificant. Okay. Um, now you could stop here, but but I wanted to go further uh, to answer the question that's actually more important. Um, the question that I wanted to answer is: Does PSA provision help judges make better decision? Right. So the reason why this question is really important is, um, you know, if for example judges um, give a harsh decision, like detain everybody then uh, maybe you can reduce the number of new crimes, but that's not really helpful because you might be incarcerating, uh, unnecessarily incarcerating some people who not commit a crime, right? So if the algorithm is really helpful, um, it should actually help judges make the right decision for each case. So if there's a case that someone who is not gonna commit a crime then the algorithm should be nudging uh, judges to give more lenient decision uh, when compared to the case where the, someone was going to commit a crime. So we need to, what this means is that we need to explore causal heterogeneity based on risk levels. So we have to look at different risk levels, how the uh, PSA provision affects the judge's decision in each case. All right, so to do that, um, we sort of developed sort of framework, uh, framework of uh, analysis in this kind of uh, algorithmic assisted human decision making. Right. So I'll give, introduce some notation. So here ZI represents PSA provision indicator. It's, it's equal to one if the PSA is given to the judge, zero otherwise. Uh, I'm gonna focus on simplest binary case to get the idea going. Uh, so I'm going to use di to represent whether that judge de detain or release. So d equal one means judge is going to detain uh, RST, and um, d equal zero means a judge will release that person. Uh, we have outcome variable. It's also binary, uh, su such as NCAFDA, uh, and we have some observed covariates, and there may be some unobserved covariates as well. Uh, we're going to use the causal inference potential outcome framework so we can think about potential value of the decision. So depending on the provision of the PSA, a uh, judge may make a different decision. So D of one would be the de decision the judge would uh, make if the PSA is given. D of zero means that decision that judge would make uh, if the PSA is not given. Uh, similarly, the outcome, the RST's behavior, is a function of both the PSA provision as well as judge decision. So we can write that as a potential outcome. Okay. I'm going to assume no interference across cases um, by focusing on the first, first arrests only. So here is assumption in a more sort of uh, graphical uh, uh, way of presenting. Uh, so what you see is that PSA is going to uh, potentially affect the judge decision. There are some characteristics observed and unobserved affecting the judge's decision as well as the RST's behavior. Um, and the decision is, uh, as well as those characteristics, is affecting the behavior. So this is sort of causal DAG um, that, that, that we are considering here. Uh, we know that the treatment assignment is essentially randomized. So the ZI is independent of all the factors, including the potential decision and outcome. Uh, and importantly, we make an exclusion restriction in that PSA doesn't have a direct effect on the behavior. Uh, it's only affecting the outcome through the decision. So this makes sense because the RST doesn't know whether the judge is receiving PSA recommendations. So we can write the potential outcome as just a function of the decision rather than function of both the PSA provision and the decision. Uh, we're gonna also assume monotonicity, which means that the detention does not make RST more likely to commit a crime. Okay, so this is the assumption that we're gonna also make. Once we make these assumptions and with notation, we can define the following causal quantity of interest. So we're gonna use the notion of principal stratification from the causal inference literature. In particular, we're gonna divide the observation into four different uh, strata uh, based on the potential outcome, value of potential outcome. Okay, so here the value of potential outcome is 
whether the RST commits a negative uh, outcome um, depending on the judge's decision. So first case, I call this preventable cases. This is the people where uh, if they are detained, they don't, make a, uh, they don't commit a ne negative outcome, uh, they don't commit a new crime, but uh, if they're released, Y of zero, um, they will commit a crime. So this is called, I'm gonna call this preventable because the judge by detaining this person can prevent a new crime. The, when the, somebody commits a crime in either way, whether detained or uh, released, regardless of judge decision, I'm gonna call this risky cases. Uh, people do commit, in a, uh, commit, commit a crime in the prison, so this actually happens. Uh, and then we can call the safe, the opposite case where the, someone wouldn't commit a crime regardless of the judge's decision, safe cases. Uh, the last case is eliminated by the monotonicity assumption that I, I discussed uh, one slide ago. Okay. So once I define these strata, a uh, group of observations, then I can define um, average causal effect of the PSA provision on judge decision among each of these cases. So what is the, what is the impact of PSA on judge decision among the preventable cases, among the risky cases, among the safe cases? So this is what I mean by causal heterogeneity based on the risk levels. Like we wanna look at causal uh, effect uh, for each risk level in order to understand whether PSA is helpful. Because as I mentioned, if the, uh, in the case of, the, actually the case is present, pre preventable, the PSA should be nudging judges to make a harsher decision. In this case, uh, encouraging judge to detain uh, RST in order to prevent a crime. If it's a safe case, then the PSA algorithm should be nudging judges to make more lenient decision because there's no need to uh, incarcerate those people. Okay? So if PSA is helpful, we should have positive uh, average effect for the preventable case, you know, harsher effect, uh, and then the negative effect that is uh, more lenient effect on the um, uh, safe cases. Now, risky cases, you know, whether what, what should be recommended depends on uh, various factors, including, um, you know, relative utilities attached to the different types of outcomes. So that's, um, that's what the uh, sort of our framework uh, is sort of based on the causal inference, uh, trying to decompose this effect into uh, different subgroups. Okay. Now, you know, you quickly realize that these cases are not actually observable, right? Because you only observe one of the two outcomes. Uh, that's the fundamental uh, difficulty of causal inference. And so for any given case, you cannot say it belongs to this case, this group or that group. So there's identification issue. Um, it turns out you can partially identify it. So the assumptions of randomization, exclusion restriction, and the monotonicity uh, would imply the following relationship where the numerator is actually identified as a function of observable data, and the denominator is something that's not really unobservable. But we know the sign of the denominator uh, for this one because of the monotonicity and the other one is because of its probability. And so the signs of a sign of these quantities is actually identifiable. Um, and we can also uh, derive the bounds on these quantities by just using sort of uh, total probability rule and um, bounding these unknown probability. Okay, so, so first step you can do is they can do partial identification, you can get the bounds without making any further assumption. Now, if you're willing to make uh, one more step and say, we're gonna assume unconfoundedness, uh, that is given that what we observe, uh, X and Z, the uh, decision is independent of the potential outcome. So, so basically this means that if I have all the observation, all the information that, judge as when judge making the decision, then this assumption is violated, uh, this assumption is satisfied. Uh, if you have unobserved covariates um, affecting both decision and outcome, then the assumption would be violated. Okay? Uh, in that case, we'll do some sensitivity analysis to see how the results are sensitive to the uh, assumptions that we make. Okay? 
So if you're willing to assume these unconfoundedness assumptions, like in this case, you know, judge decision is based on the observed characteristics, then um, we can define something called principal strata, which essentially is a proportion of each principal strata uh, given the covariate information. And causal effect can be written as basically weighted average uh, difference of, um, of the decision variable um, given the given the treatment status. Okay. So uh, this unconfoundedness assumption basically allows you to identify um, everything and you can use this formula to uh, estimate these quantities in, in whatever the model that you're interested in using. All right, um, we can extend this to the all in all decision. So judges decision are typically all in all, uh, such as bail amount. We can extend this monotonicity condition by saying that making a harsher decision uh, doesn't make more, doesn't make RST more likely to commit a crime, et cetera. And then all the, um, all the sort of uh, results go through in that case, um, the risk level in this case can, defined as least amount of bail that keeps an RST from committing NCA. So here's like a table that might be helpful. So in our case, there's a four risk levels. Um, we call safe cases, easily preventable cases, preventable cases, risky cases, because we have three decision levels, uh, signature bond, small cash bond, um, the large cash bond. So the most risky cases is where whatever the decision is, a person commits a new crime, uh, preventable case is as long as you give a large cash bond, uh, the person won't commit a crime. Easily preventable case is um, as long as you give a small cash bond, um, uh, you will not commit a crime. And then the safe case is, is someone who never commit a crime regardless of the decision. So you can sort of easily sort of, uh, you can easily extend this case, uh, all in all cases. Um, yeah, so the risk level basically tells you, um, you know, judge decision is um, is more harsh uh, than the risk level, then it won't commit a crime. Otherwise, it will commit a crime. And uh, we can look at the uh, same quantity. In this case, the interpretation, uh, there's another interpretation, it's called reduction in the proportion of NCA, attributable to this PSA provision. Okay, um, this is no parametric identification, so you can use different. Uh, models, uh, whatever flexible models you like. Um, in our analysis, we use a parametric model just because the variables are um, mostly discrete and small number. Um, okay, so uh, that's the model. It's sort of the original decision model, but let me go to the um, results of given the time constraint. So first uh, we estimated a proportion principal strata. Uh, so as you can see, uh, for this is for failure to appear. Most cases actually safe. Uh, there are very small um, proportion uh, cases that are risky. Um, the risky case is about like 20%. Uh, preventable cases are even less. Um, so a lot of cases are not even, um, not even preventable. It's either risky or safe. The same pattern holds for new criminal activity um, as well as non-violent criminal, new violent criminal activity. NVCA case, most of them are very, very safe. So like 90% of them are basically, you know, people who never commit a violent crime. Um, that's what this is saying. So, so the takeaway from this is uh, most cases are safe. Some cases are risky. There are very fewer cases where it's actually preventable. Now we look at the uh, average effects um, that I was been talking about. So this is for each risk level, what is the effect of PSA on the decision? And as you can see, like we have four strata, so different colors represent different strata, and then each uh, dot represents the decision level. So signature bond, um, small cash bond, large cash bond in that order. And as you can see, there's almost very little effect, uh, almost no effect on overall effect across different strata. So whatever the um, risk level is, the PSA doesn't seem to have much impact. Now there might be some effect among females. So it, it seems increasing most renewed decisions. So the PSA seems to be leading to the increase in the signature bond decision. 
across all strata, across risk, different risk levels. It seems that's uh, making it more, uh, more lenient among the female. You don't see that pattern for the male um, uh, at all, but for the female, that there might be some effect there. Uh, same thing for uh, NCA, you see the same pattern. And the same thing uh, for the NVCA. Now, as you get to the NVCA, this kind of slope is becoming um, evident, which means that PSA is in making the decision harsher because the harshest decision is increasing, lenient decision is decreasing, especially among the male um, and perhaps non-white females, a non-white male. Okay. However, that seems it's happening like in the riskier cases, I think that's um, particularly happening, uh, although it's happening at the safe cases as well at the, at the less extent. So it seems that among the male, the PSA is making the judge decision much, much harsher. So last thing I want to talk about is the quickly um, the fairness of judge decisions. So literature focuses on fairness of algorithmic recommendations, but we're going to look at the human decision with algorithmic algorithmic recommendation. So here the, uh, the new notion of the fairness that I collaborate, my collaborator and I came up with is based on this risk level. So conditional on risk level, the protected attribute A is independent of decision. Okay. So that's sort of the new notion. And so people with, idea is that people with similar risk levels should be treated similarly. Um, so the principal strata, that's the two potential outcomes, fully characterize the risk level. So more general idea is that those who are similarly affected by decisions should receive similar decision. And many existing fairness criteria ignore this kind of how a decision can affect the individuals. So we think this is an interesting notion that could be quite useful uh, in, in practice. Um, so we can measure this, uh, how fair a judge decision according to criteria by just compare, comparing the decision uh, differences across different racial or uh, across different protected groups given the same risk level. So given the condition on the risk level, what's the difference in decision um, between men and women or um, white and non-white? Okay. So here is the results. Uh, for each outcome, we look at uh, difference between male and female in this case. Uh, without PSA provision, that's the left one with PSA provision and then the difference between the two. So as we saw, the PSA provision is basically making uh, judges more lenient um, towards female. So the difference between the male and female, it exists uh, beforehand. So without PSA provision, actually judges tend to be more lenient towards female to begin with, but with the PSA provision, actually they become more lenient and the difference is significant. And you see that across all risk levels. So across all risk levels, even controlling for the risk level, judges are more lenient towards female uh, RSD and they become even more lenient um, after um, seeing the PSA recommendation. And you see the same thing for NCA and NVCA as well. It's, in fact, the effect seems to be even, much, even bigger. In terms of racial fairness, uh, it's actually, um, there's no impact of PSA provision. So it turns out that without PSA provision, the judge tend to be more lenient towards white RSTs compared to non-white RSTs. So there is some bias, racial bias here. Uh, with PSA provision, that doesn't change. And the difference is um, no, not statistically significant. So what you see is that um, racial fairness, uh, there's racial bias exists, but it's not affected by PSA provision. Uh, gender bias exists. Uh, it's exacerbated. Uh, it's it's um, it's getting bigger um, by um, by seeing the PSA recommendation. Okay, All right. So I'm gonna skip the optimal decision um, analysis I've done, and then just to conclude, so we can have some Q and A time. So uh, in this uh, project, we've offered a set of statistical methods for experimentally evaluating algorithm-assisted human decision-making. I focused on the pre-trial risk assessment, um, but this sort of type of experimental design and the analytical tools that we provide can be applied to any kind of uh, human decisions with um, 
algorithmic recommendation. Um, there's some potentially suggestive finding. I say suggestive because it's based on the pre preliminary data, uh, but we found a little overall effects on the judge decision, uh, more lenient decisions for females, regardless of risk levels. Um, the PSA makes leads to more stringent decisions for risky males. Um, the gender bias is widened by the PSA and the PSA has no impact on the racial bias against non-whites uh, that already exist. A signature bond, uh, I didn't present this results, but the optimal decision results suggest that in most cases, signature bond is the right thing to do um, unless the cost of a new crime is high and judge tend to be uh, much uh, more, uh, tend to give much less lenient decisions and the algorithmic recommendation uh, does the same, same thing. Uh, so we have some ongoing research. This is, uh, we have multiple experiments at, at the different locations. So this would be interesting to combine them and learn, try to learn um, generalizable results. We also have a paper that try to improve these algorithms. And um, we're also looking at the dynamic interactions over time because people get rearrested and come back to the court multiple times. And we're also analyzing uh, multidimensional uh, decisions because there's uh, release conditions and other, other factors involved. And um, yeah, it's a rich, very rich data. Um, the data actually, the preliminary data we analyzed are, are publicly available for other researchers to do um, interesting analysis. So uh, please check out my website. There's also a software package that, uh, if you're interested in implementing some of the methods that we developed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's the presentation that I have today. Thank you, Agosuke. That, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. So uh, now is the time if you have any questions to post them into to Q&A. Uh, and let me, let me start with uh, one question. So I guess you showed some graphs where you looked at the correlation between PSA and what judges are doing. I wonder whether right. you looked at whether the recommendations could in fact simulate uh, to some extent or approach what the judges are doing. You know, potentially one could train a model using uh, the cases, you know, what judges have done in the past and sort of see how uh, effective that model would be uh, when sort of applied in predicting what uh, a judge would do. And I wonder if if yeah. you have looked into that, how close would that model be in terms of uh, simulating a judge or uh, behaving like a judge? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So we haven't actually looked at um, predicting judge decision based on the factors that go into the algorithm, um, but that's interesting question. So the algorithm itself, is supposed to, you know, be a prediction for the behavior if if that person is released. Now, of course, the difficulty is that the training data set that they they must be using, we, although we don't know exact details about, you know, how they come up with this, is all based on, you know, I think what some people call selective labeling problem, where um, you know it's based on the real world data set, so the judge decisions are. Um, part of that, right? So you're looking at the arrestee's behavior conditional on judge whether judge you know decided to detain someone or release someone, and so you're looking at this very selective cases where the judges end up, ended up releasing people and then how they behaved. But here, you know that what the algorithm is supposed to do is before judge makes that decision, it's supposed to alert which cases should be uh, released or detained. Um, so, so it's it, you know they're they're supposed to be optimizing for this predictive um, ability. Um, it's hard to validate that because we only get the data after the judge make a decision, and the people either get released or not. Uh, but it is interesting because some people 
notice that um, you know there may be a similarity between like we noticed that um, you know judge decision and recommendation. So it's possible that uh, after using this kind of algorithmic tools for long, the judge somewhat internalized um, these mm -hmm. algorithmic recommendations. So their decision, even if they, even when they don't actually see it, um, you know they may be uh, immediate, you know unconsciously perhaps. Uh, imitating the type of uh, recommendations that they were getting. So the fact that the overall effect, we didn't quite find anything, like the judge doesn't seem to be affected by the recommendation. Uh, there are, you know, there are multiple reasons why that's the case. One is that judges are co completely ignoring um, the recommendation. The other one is that judge sort of, you know, by being exposed to this for a long time, they've kind of internalized that um, algorithmic recommendation itself. So their decision is becoming essentially very similar to uh, algorithmic recommendation itself. So it, it appears as if the algorithm has no impact on, on judges. So, so these are really interesting um, and important questions. Um, as you might margin, you know, the uh, use of algorithm in this kind of context, um, you know, has a potential long-term effects that may not be um, predictable or not, may not be optimal. And so, yeah, so it's, that, that's a great question. I can at least look at like how the factors, those 10 factors, you know, can we train uh, uh, algorithm that predict the judge decision and how does that compare with the algorithmic recommendation? Maybe, maybe algorithmic recommendation is already as good as um, as this kind of uh, algorithmic. You know, just just trying to predict the decision gives you the same same recommendation as the as the existing algorithm. Right. There is a question in uh, Q and A. Would you like to take that okay. next? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so the uh, question uh, Francis asks, uh, if the algorithm gets more precise, it will be interesting to randomly assign decisions between judge makes, um, oh, okay, so randomly assign a PSA um, decision, a P result decision? Oh, okay, hold on. I'm not understanding the second part. It will be interesting to randomly assign decisions between judge, Maybe Francis is, if you're there, can you um, clarify or just not quite understanding the question that you're asking? Sorry. Yeah, I don't, wanna... you, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I was yeah. like, so so it, if the random assignment happens after, so the, the half of the d judge's decisions are, act, are implemented basically, whether they use PSA That's right. or didn't use That's PSA. Right. And then right. the other half, the PSA overrides and independent right. of what the judge would say, the PSA makes the assignment and then compare um, oh, I see. to accuracy of behave, future behaviors. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's essentially impossible at least right now for the ethical reasons. So that's right, that's um, right. I thought that's right. Yeah, right. yeah. institutional review board wouldn't uh, approve that. Yeah, so that's that's the you know sort of the difficulty is is um, you know ideally we want to know like you know having a human decision maker compare that with um, algorithmic decision and then compare that with you know human plus algorithm um, that would be the sort of three mode of decision making and we we would you know it'd be interesting to see how that works but but in this context. Um, yeah, basically we cannot take away the judge's decision, um, right? So, yeah, unfortunately that's um, that's not possible. But but in other context, you know, more um, perhaps low risk context or when the um, experimental subjects are willing to uh, willing to you know consent to that type of uh, decision making system, we might be able to. Um, look at that. And that would be super interesting, I think. 
Kosuki, maybe I uh, can ask one more uh, question. Yeah, sure. So in terms of the features that uh, are used by BSA to make the recommendation, mm -hmm. so I understood that age and some basic demographic information is being used to what extent more detailed socio-demographic information is being used, you know. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, occupation, home, zip code, which may be a proxy for uh, socioeconomic status, to what extent some of this information is being used? Yeah, so in this case, the only demographic information that's being used is age. So there's no, it's not that other information is not available, but I think sort of legally and the politically, uh, which factors should be used is a big, you know, big, big issue. So, um, you know, the people don't want to use race and gender and um, place they live and stuff um, that, you know, they feel that's, um, I think, unfair uh, for these kind of algorithms to be, you know, to be relying on. So that's why they only use criminal history and, and the age. Um, itself to produce these algorithms. So, you know, by design, it's a small number of factors. Um, the prediction is not going to be good when you have only such a limited amount of information. And so that, you know, there's really a real question of like, should we be using this kind of algorithmic recommendations? Um, and even if so, how does that really affecting the judge's decision in because you know the, the data I, I presented to you today which I, again available public available uh we made it public available um is is a real world cases so um this is actually the decision that judges made uh in the real world with the actual um algorithmic recommendations that's being used um okay and maybe uh, taking advantage that there is no other Q&A question, one uh, more question. To what extent do you think, so I'm, I'm assuming that in these court proceedings, right? So there is some back and forth mm -hmm. with potentially an attorney right. or with the RST uh, themselves. Uh, to what extent that information may be useful and, and maybe whether there is a potential of capturing that uh, through a transcript and then yes. you know, use NLP or use other uh, methods to take that into account in terms of making a recommendation. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So we actually currently requesting the transcript uh, for all these court proceedings because there's a lot of information there. And once once we have that information, you know, we can uh, make more assumptions, more reliable, uh, more credible. And so, yeah, so we're in the process of obtaining uh, transcripts. Now the transcripts done in the court is very complicated because they have their own, you know, system, shorthand systems, and that needs to be translated and so on. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a costly and uh, lengthy process of obtaining that information, but but it's, you know, the information is there. So it's definitely something that um, analysts should be able to incorporate um, in mm -hmm. this kind of research, yes. Okay. All right, right. so I think we are getting close to uh, the top of the hour. So perhaps uh, this is a good time to close it. And I would like to thank you for, for joining us today, all of you. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Imai for, agreeing to present our distinguished uh, seminar series. Uh, and uh, just a note that uh, look out for our announcements on March 27th. We have uh, another presentation by Jennifer Hill, who is a professor of applied statistics at uh, NYU. So thank you also on behalf of the junior faculty fellows uh, who are organizing this, uh, this series. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, take care. Bye bye.